Funding for This Is Nashville comes from you, our listeners, and Amazon, proud sponsor of WPLN's daily show, This Is Nashville, engaging our differences so we can discover our unity. More on Amazon's community work at aboutamazon.com. I'm Khalil A. Colonna, and this is Nashville. In today's episode, we're checking in on former Second Avenue residents and property owners, as well as getting updates about where development stands on the street. What will the future of the street be? How does the street's history help us understand our culture in Nashville today? Well, to learn more, I'd like to talk with our first guest, James Hobler. He is a retired curator at the Tennessee State Museum. Welcome, James. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Khalil. All right. So I, I want to want to talk a little bit about Second Avenue, what it was like back then in the 18th century when it was known more commonly as Market Street. If we were to time travel and go back there, what would we see and experience? You'd see that we were a riverfront city, which helped us as, as early as 1819 to have riverboats coming in and out of Nashville. And the very first uh, store owner in the 18th century was Lardner Clark, and he had a store down near uh, the corner of Bank Street and then Market Street or 2nd Avenue. And as that neighborhood developed, it became uh, both residential, commercial, and then by the 20th century, almost entirely commercial. But it it had a very interesting history. Uh, That's sort of where Nashville got its birth. You know, when James Robertson walked across the river and up to the bluff, that's one of the first things they saw mm. back in the 18th century. What were the streets like? What was going on? Well, when they got here, there were no streets. It was just, <laughs> yeah. you know, it, it was raw frontier. Uh, the Native Americans had depopulated the area because they'd fought over it amongst the different tribal groups for so often that they called it the dark and bloody ground. So mm. they decided they would depopulate it and use it as a common hunting reserve. So when Europeans and African enslaved people came here in the 18th century, they weren't very happy. These people are, are, are going to occupy land that we share with many other peoples. Mm-hmm. And there were almost uh, 20 years of fighting between the indigenous peoples and these, these outcomer, outliers, our ancestors, that came into this area. Uh, but by the early 1800s, that had calmed down and Nashville was was finally developing. Right, so, Jim, as Nashville was developing, tell me what the role of Second Avenue was or Market Street back then, what it was in local and regional economies. How did it how did it boom? How did it boost everything? It, it's it was the commercial heart of the city. And that's why it's surrounded with these these tall buildings. They would offload goods from the river on First Avenue they take them up elevators onto the, the first floor on 2nd Avenue and sell them and then store things up above. They would also rent some of that space sometimes for people to live in. So it was very much what we're hoping it, it will become again a live and work area in the city. But that was the very economic heart of the city for about 100 years. Now, we know that enslaved humans were sold at the courthouse during those times. Did that practice stretch all the way down throughout the totality of 2nd Avenue? Most of the slave markets were up near the corner of 4th and and now Martin Luther King Boulevard, uh, Charlotte. And in fact, the the Historical Commission, State Historical Commission, put up a marker there a couple of years ago for the Nashville slave market. There's even a business envelope at the State Museum that sells pe- shows people selling human beings on that corner with the state capitol, you know, a symbol of democracy mm-hmm. right behind them. Democracy for who? <laughs> mm-hmm. That's a good question. Now, after the Civil War, buildings went from being wooden structures to brick buildings. Can you describe the architecture that was used and why this change kind of symbolized a shift in the culture of the city here for the future? Well, Nashville originally was using a lot of wooden construction, and of course that's very flammable. For for example, the old First Presbyterian or downtown pres at Fifth and Church, the first two buildings burned down. Mm-hmm. So by the, the decades prior to the Civil War, Nashville was building predominantly in brick. Uh, as recently as the 1980s, there were still a couple of those pre-Civil War buildings down there on 2nd Avenue. An arsonist burned a whole block down in the 1980s. It's gone. It's a parking lot. There's only the facade of the other 1850s building because when they were developing Washington manufacturing, 
they decided to make it into an atrium. So only mm. the facade is original to that. But, okay. But brick was was a fire retardant, and that's why most of those buildings are brick. A lot of them are very eclectic. There's Italian eight. Uh, the uh, the Ray building is one of my favorites. It has these these cast iron like wolf heads that were up there. Uh, some of that was salvaged after the bomber destroyed the whole facade of that. Uh, they even salvaged individual bricks so those can go back into the building so it will look like it used to. Mm. Now, kind of jumping forward to more recent times, the 2020 Christmas Day bombing wasn't the first disaster that Second Avenue has survived. Mm -mm. What others have happened and in, and how did it shape the street? What other disasters has Second Avenue seen? Well, the most other recent one was in the early uh, uh, 1980s where a Alabama developer wanted to buy the entire block from 2nd Avenue to 1st Avenue and from Church Street to Bank Street. They wanted to put up a 24-story office tower there, and mm -hmm. Metro told them, that's a historic district. We won't allow that. One night, the entire block caught fire mm -hmm. by arson. Okay. And the fire marshal's somewhat cryptic response was the source of the fire was out of state. Okay. They knew who did it, but they couldn't prove it. Okay. <laughs> also in the 1930s, I believe it was, that whole stretch of second from Broadway to Church Street on the west side, they demolished all of the facades of those buildings because transportation had changed. We weren't using carts. We were using semi-trucks. Mm. And they needed a larger turning area, so they set back the whole street many feet there on the west side. So if you go up to, like, the corner of Church in Second, you'll see how far, far back they set it. You know, flooding happens in the region sometimes. Has it ever been hit by a flood? Oh, Lord, yes. Almost. <laughs> well, the, one of the two biggest ones, other than the, the uh, 2020, was in the 1920s, in 26, and then about 1936, there were two big floods on the Cumberland before TVA had dammed it up. And there's a, a one of my favorite pictures of that area is a riverboat floating on Lower Broadway because <laughs> the, the, the river had backed up that far, almost Fifth Avenue. It was a riverboat full of bachelorettes. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> yeah, I had, had to ask. All right, so... You, you, you mentioned how they destroyed the facades for semi-trucks to go through. How did the invention of cars, how did that impact the street design and how it's used? Well, it, it's impacted it several times. It used to be two-way most of the street, and now it's, it's largely one-directional. Uh, we hope that when they reopen the street, it will be more pedestrian-friendly. They want to have, like, bistros on the sidewalks. They want to have it more, more walkable. Uh, but not quite the mayhem of Lower Broad. Mm. You know, in, in the 1970s, it was a street of warehouses. People were mostly working during those, right. you know, there. What pushed the street's function to evolve into a more residential place? Because as you mentioned, it's always had some history of workplace, mm -hmm. residential areas, uh, structures down there. Mm -hmm. What pushed it to be a little bit more commercial, inviting restaurants and things? One of the things I think was Mayor Dick Fulton. He uh, he had grown up here over in the Edgefield neighborhood on, on the East Bank. He loved the history of the city. And developers were looking at trying to demolish all of Second Avenue for high-rise development. Uh, remember, this is the period where they wanted to demolish the Ryman Auditorium. Uh, the Hermitage Hotel was, was really shabby. Do we tear it down? Uh, the same thing with the Customs House with Union Station. And Historic Nashville was formed to help fight that and to try and preserve some of our local history. The Metro Historical Commission, being a government agency, couldn't ad advocate quite as forcefully as Historic Nashville. And people like Fletch Koch uh, and Bill Koch, they helped organize things like the Market Street Festival, which was to focus on these old buildings and try and get people to see the beauty of them and the importance of preserving where we came from. And so the Market Street Festival helped turn that whole thing around. Mm. What does it mean that, you know, when we call buildings or a street historic, why does that matter to us humans? One of my favorite uh, answers to that is Grapes of Wrath by John Steinbeck. Mm. These people have been dispossessed from the land. They are broke. They're going to go to California and try and find their their physical salvation. 
And so the Jodes are loading up their car with everything. And Ma Jode knows how important her heritage is. So she keeps stuffing it and they keep taking stuff out. And finally, she's so frustrated. She says, how are you going to know who you are unless you know where you come from? Mm. And that's what the build environment shows us. It, it shows us how we have evolved over time. What do you what do you see the future for Second Avenue as? What do you want Second Avenue to look like in 10, 15, 20 years? I want the facades to look like they used to, but I want it to be vibrant. I want there to be restaurants. I want there to be shops. I want people living upstairs. Uh, you know, a few a few bars, not quite like Lower Broadway, mm -hmm. but you know, I, I want it to be more Nashville centric rather than tourist centric. James Hubler is a retired curator of the Tennessee State Capitol and Museum. Jim, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. All right, we're going to take a short break. When we come back, we'll talk with two for some former residents, property owners, and business owners of Second Avenue who are still rebuilding their lives. Stay with us. This is Nashville. Funding for This is Nashville comes from you, our listeners, and Music City Prep Clinic, Nashville-based provider for prep and offering comprehensive sexual health services in an environment designed to be safe, professional, and shame-free. Learn more at musiccityprep.org. I'm Khalil A. Colonna, and this is Nashville. Today, we're talking about Second Avenue. Now, before the break, we spoke with James Hubler about the historic and cultural and economic importance of Second Avenue. See, the street was the epicenter of where the city of Nashville started and was vibrant because of the proximity to the Cumberland River, which had quick access to steamboats, moving food, produce, and other necessities. After the Civil War, the buildings were redeveloped into Victorian-style architecture that signified new wealth in the city. Some of the buildings we see today were built between 1870 and 1900 and have withstood multiple disasters, including flooding and most recently, the 2020 Christmas Day bombing. Let's hear a clip. Hey, man. Hey. Go that way, man. You're good. You just go that way. Dude, trust me, go that way. Please. I saw it go off this morning. I know it. Keep going that way. As far as y'all can. Pardon? Do you know what it was offhand? Not exactly. It was pretty big. It was yeah. a pretty big fireball. It was right on top of it. It was right on top of here. It was a pretty big yep. fireball. Yeah, it was. So keep going. Okay. I, 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 no, I appreciate it, guys. Keep going, though. Oh, yeah, yeah. 221 on that fourth and church. Last shot over here by Alley. That was body cam footage from a Metro police officer directing pedestrians in the immediate early morning aftermath of the 2020 Christmas Day bombing. So what have the recovery efforts been like since then? How were people how and where were how were people's lives affected? And so to get that answer. We're going to talk to former residents, property owners and business owners who are still rebuilding their lives after this latest disaster. Mario Dion is in the early stages of build. He was in the early stages of, of building their business manifestations, co-working and consulting when the 2020 Christmas Day bombing jolted them on a new path. I'd like to welcome Mario to This is Nashville. Mario, thanks for being here, man. Appreciate you having me. All right. So describe the vision for your business for manifestations, co-working spaces and, you know, what you were trying to work to bring to life? Uh, just for as a creative, we know, like, downtown's a beautiful place. And so what we were doing uh, had opened the space up for creatives, artists, um, photographers, whether you were from out of town or in town. Um, they were able to come into the space, and instead of putting furniture in there, we left it, you know, fully open. And it became this space for, like, uh, if you wanted to have a recording session, you could set it up. It mm. was just, uh, I would say, super creative uh, and collaborative um, in closing the vision uh, for it was to create a hub where uh, black creatives could be downtown uh, there's not a lot of spaces down there in there where we can come down and just be creative uh, culturally and so without having to make it a race thing or whatever it's like we just got the space and it just created it and it was starting to grow 
How was business growing? But but when the the bombing happened, how far along were you all on this path? We were three months in. Wow. <laughs> yeah, so I got in uh, October, uh, super steel. I'll say that on the cost. Uh, you wouldn't believe what we were probably paying. But um, business went was going really good. People would book things like there was a fo- couple photo shoots for Thanksgiving. There was a lot more photo shoots than there were actual like recording sessions and things like that. Um, but around November, things really picked up, and December was really good. And even on Christmas Eve, um, myself and a couple other you know colleagues, um, we had got ready for the festivities mm-hmm. per se, and had um, had everything ready for Christmas Day. You know, we were ready and. Uh, Woke up that morning and it's like change of plans. Talk to me about that 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 moment if you can. When you woke up, you were sleeping when the bombing happened. Mm-hmm. Tell tell me what you remember, what you recall. Um, well, first, um, when I woke up, it felt like I was in a dream because the ceiling was falling, and so it like it kept it's like a twenty foot ceiling. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the door from the high attic and the beams had fallen. They were hitting me. The stuff was breaking. And I thought I was in a dream. I was like, man, this hurts. You know, like yeah. opened my eyes and um, couldn't really see. It was like water, which looked like it was like black, you know, like water was going everywhere. And um, I had to crawl to the floor to get off from under the debris. Um, and there was a bathroom and I remember seeing the light and I was just, I didn't know, you know, what was going on. I remember I made it into the bathroom and I called maintenance. Mm. <laughs> and I'm like, hey, yeah. you sold me a janky, you know, and just <laughs> know something really yeah, wrong there's with something this place. going on with this place. And, uh, you know, uh, I had a friend over and he comes around the corner and we just look at each other. And he said, we have about 30 seconds. You need to get everything that you love or that's like valuable. And we got to get out of here. Wow. So you crawled under debris. You 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 got out really yeah. You, I was you under really, debris. Yeah, you yeah, got yeah, really yeah. lucky that you didn't get seriously injured. Yes. What was going through your mind? Um, I grabbed uh, my son's. Um, I grabbed his bike. Um, I have merch. Um, the Royce Gold that you see here. We had several boxes of merch. I grabbed the merch. Um, some photos and things from you know from family. I had like a keepsake box, and that was all. You know, I didn't. Uh, didn't even put on socks and shoes. Mm. Uh, we went through, there was glass, you know, everything. And just, I remember my feet not being cut up right. uh, and just being like, wow. But I think that's like the adrenaline kicking in. It's like, this is our only way out. Did you help some of your neighbors? You ran into your neighbor who told you you had 30 seconds. Did you see other neighbors? Did you all yes. begin to help each other get escaped? Yes. Um, there were myself and the uh, roommate that was with me. As we were going down, you would see... There were some people who were frantic, you know, some people who were just evacuating because it was kind of like, I would think about it like school when a fire drill happens, it's to exit. Mm-hmm. The thing that was um, challenging or difficult was where we were, you couldn't get on the elevator. So the only way out was the parking garage. Um, people who had made it out the front door onto second, that was no longer you can no longer even get that way because things have fallen down. Okay. Um, I remember the parking garage water was starting to leak, and um, I had called um, a friend and was like, hey. You know, I called a couple people, and I was like, hey, I don't know what's going on. We're in this parking garage. Don't know if I'm make it out. But, uh, man, call. You know, we're trying to get help and get out of here. And um First responders, I think, I think like I seen firemen come down first and they were like, hey, you know, you're okay in the snap. Where are you going? And the garage out to First Avenue was still working mm-hmm. and uh, we were able to get out. And once we got out, you know, we ran to office, kind of like that call that you played. Yeah. There was like officers pretty much everywhere and they were just telling us uh, they weren't sure, but, you know, to get out of here. You know, in, in the days and weeks after... What was going through your mind? You're you're going to sleep. Your business is really, honestly, getting off the ground. It's months old, but things are looking promising. Then this event happens where not only does it damage your location of your business, but where you were sleeping and living as well. What was going through your mind? How were you trying to adapt to the new reality that you were in? Um, interesting enough, like in the creative world, there was a new app that had just came out clubhouse. Um, Mm -hmm. and so I remember 
taking a different approach and I kind of got on Clubhouse and just kind of, I would say I mastered how to work the app. And so I started holding rooms and I kind of just kept that positive spirit as being somebody who wants to create a space for other creatives. And I was like, if I can't do it in this space, you know, I'll use and it because I was already in that mindset of energy. I think it just kind of came a lot more natural mm -hmm. to do because on the app you have rooms and hubs. And so um, creating those different types of rooms and talking about professional things and how to grow. That's essentially what we were doing when they would come into the space. It's like, yeah, you booked the space, but we're going to be in here as well and help you grow what it is you're trying to do and assist as well. How, does, how has this impacted your life? Um, obviously for the better, like I'm alive. Um, I would, I would definitely say, I wish I was still there. I'd be a lot further ahead just because the city has grown. Um, it's still a, a beautiful place down there, but I think with anything that happens where it's like a disaster or life changing, once you get through and you kind of move on, like where I'm at now, like I'm still doing the creative stuff. But I feel like I'm better because I did make it through that and I, I didn't give up and I didn't let. And it, to be honest, the insurance, nothing really, I got it, but it didn't replace what we were building, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you been in touch with your neighbors who you used to live next to? Um, yeah, there was a couple. And then we have an email chain. Okay. So uh, we stayed in contact with each other for about a couple of years and then... Just being honest, it just kind of, you know, people handle things differently and it kind of became one of those things where some people were like, hey, I'm going to move on or I'm going to excuse or could you not, yeah, you know, reply all. But um, think about it all the time when we drive through there. Sometimes my son's like, hey, when are we moving home, you know, moving yeah. back home? And uh, now it, he's older. Uh, he was three when it happened. But now that he's like older, it's kind of like um, – I'm glad I was able to offer him that memory and experience of life. So although we don't have it anymore, uh, for me, the positive is that I, my son got to experience that and how it happened for him. He wasn't at home when it happened. Isn't my experience. Yeah. So. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Oh, no problem. We're going to shift to talk about property and business owners that have been on the streets since at least the nineties for that. Let's welcome in Ron Lim. He's the owner of a hostel that ran for 20 years on second Avenue. And he's joined by Demetrius Kelly, owner of melting, melting pot and Rodizio. Ron and Demetrius. Thank you so much for being here. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you for having us. You know, can you both describe like Nashville and Second Avenue that you were in when you decided to open your business? What was it like? Ron, you go first. Sure. Um, so we actually um, started our business away from Second Avenue, but uh, moved into Second Avenue in 2012. In 2012, the first avenue was sort of like a treated as a back alley of the Second Avenue. Um, and the building that, that I acquired um, stretched from 1st Avenue to 2nd Avenue. Um, and there really wasn't a whole lot going on. Um, there were chronic uh, homelessness, as it, it still is a little bit. Um, and uh, it, it was a bit of a gamble uh, opening up a business where, you know, wasn't sure that the commerce would spill over from the Broadway into the... Uh, corner of First Avenue and Church and Second Avenue, that area. Um, but, uh, you know, as soon as we opened in 2012, um, business really started taking off, and, mm -hmm. and we grew right along with, with Nashville. Nashville went through just tremendous growth. And, and any given year, we were hosting people from, you know, some 40-plus different countries. Wow. Yeah, fifteen to 20,000 new visitors from all around the world. Um, so it, it was, it was, it did really well for 10 years. And where, so word was getting around amongst foreigners about, Hey, if you come to Nashville, this is your place is the place to go. Oh, oh absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, uh, it's kind of funny, you know, Nashville, it's, it's, it's uh, people drink a lot and a lot of times okay. they, uh, you know, they fall down and they, you know, they're not that, uh, coherent. Um, the police, used to just bring these uh, younger uh, foreigners. Mm -hmm. If they find them like not able to communicate with them, they just automatically bring to us because they know okay. that if you're young and if you're traveling, if you're a backpacker type from another country, 
the chances are that they will stay, you know, they'll be staying at a hostel. So okay. they'll just drop drop them off, and you know, and more often than not, yeah, they were our guests. Okay. All right. Now, now, Demetrius, what was what was Second Avenue like when you brought your businesses there? Oh uh, wow! So um, I actually um, um was part of the second wave of the restaurant open. The restaurant opened in nineteen ninety five. Um, I came on in 2001. Um, so it, it's actually a funny story. Um, you know, working with my business partner, he told me that, um, you know, when he came to the Second Avenue space, um, there was no entrance to the building from actual Second Avenue. You had to get into the building from First Avenue. And he said he remember going up the back hallway and um, just seeing like, you know, dirt and, you know, you know, wow, like, you know, these old. Um, you know, 18, 100 walls. And, um, you know, obviously it's a you know, warehouse. It was, I, I think it was storing materials for heat hall, you know, back in the nineties. Wow. And uh, uh, he said, this is it. Like, I know it doesn't look like much now, but like this has history and, you know, character. And you know, part of the melting pots, um, you know, original history was, you know, being a restaurant, you know, in the fondue in general was coming around a communal pot and being able to enjoy a dinner with friends um, and share. Um, and that's what he felt like the city was growing into. And so, um, you know, they started construction, uh, you know, finished out the restaurant. Um, the irony is in 1996, I moved here from Detroit. I was a um, a General Motors transplant. You know, my mom's you know, factory you know, closed and they gave her options. They're like, you know, you can move to Kansas City or you can move, you know, to the Spring Hill area. And work, um, you know, for Saturn, you know, because you know that was the GM product that was being produced. Mm -hmm. And in that first year, when I was sixteen, uh, some of my friends in, in Franklin said, "Let's go downtown to Second Avenue." You know, let's go to Laser Quest. And I was like, "What's Laser Quest?" And they were like, "Oh, it's a you know art, you know, it's a you know zapper game where you shoot each other with lasers." No, and like, so like laser tag. Downtown. Yeah, okay. exactly. So, so you come downtown, and laser tags in the building where. The melting pot was so as a 16 year old kid i see this really cool restaurant um that's serving fondue that i'm like i can't afford that but i can go you know i can go play laser tag um so you know fast forward 2001 um i had the opportunity to you know get a new serving job and i said i remember this place and i remember you know seeing it not being able to you know afford to eat there you know as a six year old kid you know i'm gonna work there um so um you know started there in you know 2001 and then watch just the city change ar around us, you know, watching, you know, um, you know, you know, all nightclubs and, you know, places that you know, people will kind of sneak into and, you know, and out and, you know, we, you know, folks would go down Perna's Alley and, you know, go to Brass Stables when, you know, it was there um, to all of a sudden it became more family oriented and, you know, people were there all day and all night, you know, mm -hmm. you, you know, watching the city become a safe haven, you know, for bachelorettes, you know, so, you know, people were, you know, they were trying to choose between, you know, Vegas or else to go, you know, Nash Vegas was the, you know, better option, you know, um, and it, it, it brought a lot of life, um, you know, to, you know, downtown. So, um, as our melting pot grew, um, that we decided, you know, let's do something else. This is something else that that's an experience that's fun. Um, so that's where we decided to do the Rodizio grill, um, you know, as a Brazilian steakhouse offering because um you know there wasn't you know one in the city at that time um you know just another experience to you know to make natural you know natural the you know the mix of people um and diversity you know we're bringing in you know, something that was a you know brazilian culture so yeah um it's it's changed you know a lot i mean like you know you don't realize there's a lot of diversity in in a city to you put a different concept in and then that um, is able to trigger a emotional reaction to someone who is from that country mm -hmm. that has that background. That's like, oh wow, like you know, the flooding in of Brazilian employees we had. Um, you know, guests. You know, you know, we would get a lot of um, the people who were um, you know Mormon uh, who were like, you know, wow, I, you know, I did my mission trip, you know, to Brazil, and this is all I ate for two years. So you know, this is awesome. So you're able to have that. You so. were bringing in people from all over. I, I I really I understand that. If you and if you're just tuning in, this is Nashville, and I'm your host, Khalil Lake Alona. We're talking this hour about historic Second Avenue. My guests are Ron Lim, Demetrius Kelly, and Mario Dion. Okay, so Ron, ask answer this for me. What were you doing when you got news about the bombing? 
Well, actually, um, I was at home. I, I now live on uh, in a separate property in, on West End. I used to live right on top of our um, top floor of our building, but by that time I had moved out. It was a Christmas day. I remember getting a phone call right at six thirty a.m. You know, I, I'm an owner operator, so I, um, when a fire alarm goes off, the first call that gets directed. Um, other than the fire department is my phone. My phone. So mm-hmm. I get this call, and I remember thinking that, oh, my gosh, it's 6.30 in the morning, and someone pulled the fire alarm. Yeah. And, and that happens because, you know, the Nashville being a drinking town, a lot of times people, they get drunk, and they just they pull fire they, alarm. They think it's fun, yeah. Yeah. And I thought, 6.30 in the morning, really? You know, <laughs> yeah. So I get up out of the bed, and, you know, I, and in our building, I had installed some 40-plus security cameras around the hallways and whatnot. Um, and I log into my computer, uh, open up the uh, CC camera, and, all, and I see, like, there's smoke in the building. And I thought, well, maybe something more than fire alarm. Maybe there's something else that's gone off. And I'm flipping through, through this uh, CCTV camera, and then the camera came to the uh, one that is looking outward from the Second Avenue, um, to the Second Avenue, and the whole side of the entrance is gone. It's, I mean, it's like literally, I could see the street. Wow! And and they're just, I could see the fire sprinkler just going off. And and at that moment, I was like, Oh my God! This this, this is something really bad. Something really bad happened. And I jumped out of bed and, and I told my wife that I I, I got to get to downtown. Um, and I put on whatever I can. I just rushed out the door, and it's about, you know, seven to ten minute drive to downtown. And I got to the street, and all the streets uh, streets were blocked off. There were police standing there, there, and they wouldn't let me get close. Um, and I pulled off, and I, rem- I remember looking at the building, and I, I remember some of our guests trickling out and just standing there. And that day was so extremely cold that morning. I just remember just being frozen because mm. I didn't wear enough, you know, jumping out of my bed and, and getting there. Yeah. And I was just frozen. And I could see my guests, and they weren't wearing much, and they were also standing in front of the building just sh- shivering. Um, wow. So you're, that, that's, that, that's pretty riveting. Um, Demetrius, briefly, can you tell me what was happening? In, in, what what, what, oh, went, through, when, what um, went through your mind when you heard the news? Well, uh, you know, for me, shock. You know, um, at that point in time, I, um, I have three kids. They're they're four, seven, and nine now. So the so I had one that was um, that was just you know nine months old at that point in time, and then you know my other kids. So so I've been up. You know, it's Christmas Eve, so I've been up. You know, doing my parental you know duties to get you know everything you know ready for them to wake up on Christmas morning. You know, because Santa you know, came and, um, I had just gone to bed about three or four o'clock in the morning. Um, so same kind of thing as Ron, you know, phone rings. It's my, um, my alarm company saying, Hey, there's motion in your back door because the back doors have blown open. And so I'm like, Oh, somebody's breaking in on you know Christmas. Oh, this is, you know, this is ridiculous. It's six 30 in the morning. And while I'm on the phone with them, logging into my computer to look at my security cameras, like Ron, the alarm company from Redizio calls and said, Hey, there's motion in your back door. Mm. I'm like, how is somebody breaking into both buildings at one time? This is, you know, ridiculous. So then I look and one of my remaining cameras, I see water and smoke pouring down the front stairs, uh, you know, into the melting pot space because it was underground. I'm like, what happened? So I immediately call my landlord. She lives in the building and she lives, you know, she was the, you know, the first people that the news talked to because um, she heard the announcements coming from the truck. And so I call her and I'm like, Betsy, you know, what's going on? And, um, you know, did my ovens go off? Did like, I, did I blow up the building? Like, you know, did my kitchen mm. blow up the building? And she goes, no, we got bombed. And I'm like, what? So she goes to the store to explain to me, you know, what happened. So now I'm throwing on clothes because I'm, you know, I'm running down there to see what happens. And my wife, I want to say she, you know, she tackled me, but she was like, you're not leaving. Like, I was like, I got to go check on the restaurant. She was like, you just got told that there's a bomb. There could be more bombs getting ready to go off. You could go down there to go check on it. And that could be what the bomber wants. 
and have it, so I'm emotional. I'm crying. You know, my kids are still asleep and I'm trying to figure out, like, how do I go through this day, you know, um, and give my kids a happy Christmas um, like I'm supposed to and still not know if I have a future or not know if I have a business to make money, you know, the, the next day. That's so be, I had to then start calling. Yeah. That's got to be quite the, calling. the challenge. I imagine that's quite yeah. the challenge. But, you know, Ron. I understand that, you know, you, you're battling in negotiation with the insurance company. But talk to me about this. Like, how has that temporary closure of your business, how has that impacted and shaped your life since then? Oh, gosh. Um, well, um, the insurance uh, negotiation is still ongoing. Um, and I'll just leave those people who are expert at dealing with that to deal with that. Uh, in the meantime, um, my life, our family's life, has been put on hold. Um, I mean, when the bombing happened, my business was doing really well. I mean, we had grown right along with Nashville. Um, I'm reaching, you know, my mid fifty, starting to really think about the kind of retirement. Just kind of everything is on cruise control, and and just like that, you know, everything stopped. Now. There's a being a business owner is one thing, but also being a property owner is a little bit different equation because in owning a property, quite often you're leveraged, mm. um, meaning you have a debt on the property and you know and whatnot. And if you don't have an operation going, it can be very, very challenging. So you know, you know, I was kind of turning into like easing into my retirement, just being comfortable for the rest of the time t into all of them. Okay, what now? What, what do I yeah. do? You know, how do I manage this? I understand. Now, I'm, I want to finish up. I wish I had more time for you all, but, but Mario, you know, what, do you hold out hope for Second Avenue? What do you want it to look like in the future? Um, I think how it's coming along now um, is the right direction as just to the whole city. Um, as far as the future goes, um, I hope it continues to be a space that exemplifies like the culture of the city, like living down there and walking down there. Like when you're down there, there's a energy that feels like um, kind of like when you're in a big city like New, New York, uh, if you're like in L.A. or Chicago, like Nashville has that. And so maybe it's not what it looks like, but more so what it feels like as long as the feeling stays like something like, hey, this is Nashville. Do you all feel like um, the city is, real quick, I'm going to leave this for you, Demetrius. Do you feel like the city is doing a good job in its efforts to rebuild the area? Yes, they can. Uh, you, know, you know, you're dealing with 200 year old you know, streetscapes. Um, you know, you find surprises every day. You can't dig up a hole without finding another mess, you know, up under. So, I mean, they're doing the best they can to, you know, keep in constant communication with us. You know, they're always open. You know, Ron has, you know, you know, he has his insurance, you know, issues. You know, my building has, you know, its insurance issues. So a lot of times it's just a waiting game. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the question is how long can you wait? Cause you want to go back to, you know, where you know and love, but at the same time, you know, you do have to you know, realize life is still moving ahead. So, you know, it creates his own, you know, set of challenges that you have to work through. So All right. I wanna but, thank I wanna thank all of you. Sorry, that's all the time we've got. I wanna thank all of you for being here thank you. and offering your perspective. Ron Lim, Demetrius Kelly, and Mario Dion again, gentlemen. Thank you so much and good luck to you in the future. Thank you very much. All thank right. You. We're gonna take one last break. When we return, we'll talk with the city official who is overseeing the recovery efforts on Second Avenue. You can join the conversation by tweeting us at this is Nashville. We'll be right back. Khalil A. Colonna, and this is Nashville. We've been talking about historic Second Avenue. At the top of the show, we learned about the street's history up until the bombing of Christmas on Christmas Day in 2020. And we just learned how residents and property owners are adjusting to new life 
after that bombing as we try to rebuild. Now, we're going to end our episode talking with the city official who's overseeing the redevelopments of the famous street. Michelle Scopel is the Metro Department and Housing Agency Senior Project Lead. I'd like to welcome her to This is Nashville. Michelle, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Okay, so tell us, what is the vision for the redevelopment of 2nd Avenue? Well, it was interesting listening to the other speakers here today because, honestly, um, I think the sentiment, the history, the special vibe that has been on 2nd Avenue, that's the goal. We want to continue that. Build a space for locals, kind of create something that's different than Broadway, which is a wonderful thing for our city. But 2nd Avenue is different and always has been. And that's really led the charge for how we're rebuilding it. You want it to be something that's pedestrian friendly, right? Yeah. What does that look like? What are some of the, give me an idea of what the vision is. Yeah. Well, um, you know, previously there were four lanes on 2nd Avenue. So you had two travel lanes and two parking lanes. Um, We looked at having a pedestrian only street uh, because that was something that was a a focus of a lot of folks want to have pedestrian access only. But you have a lot of businesses, a lot of deliveries, a lot of garages. There's really a need to have that that vehicle traffic there. So we've maintained the two lanes of traffic. But essentially the 40 parking spots that were there, we are turning that into a sidewalk. So mm. now we essentially have up to 25-foot sidewalks on either side of the street. Okay. Yeah. So I, know, I understand the city has hosted multiple community sessions. What did you incorporate? How did you incorporate that community feedback while you were developing this plan? I think I can say we have we've had multiple dozen community okay. events. We have really genuinely um, listened to the stakeholders, folks like Ron Lim, Demetrius. They've been very involved in this whole process. All of the building owners, uh, the general public. I mean, we the first meeting that we held was February, early mm-hmm. February of 2021. You know, a month and a half after, and it was raw. I mean, it was very raw. A lot of emotions, um, but really from that moment on, we started to hear what people loved about Second Avenue and what they didn't love about Second Avenue, what could be better. And so there was a great charge to build back better, which was wonderful. And uh, we were able to take components of what people wanted and put that into the design. So, I mean, genuinely has been led by the stakeholders down to the point where we've got specific ideas like crosswalks that have artistic flair to it. That was one of, Hmm. it was actually Betsy. It was one of the uh, residents' ideas, and we're putting that into place. Do you feel like, I mean, projects like this take time, and sometimes people who live there and business owners can be a little bit frustrated at the the length of time that it takes, Mm -hmm. but it doesn't seem like that's what's happening with you and the stakeholders and the people of 2nd Avenue. It feels like because you've had dozens and dozens of community meetings, There's an understanding and there's a relationship there. Is that sort of what's going on? And can that be an example for other projects happening in the city and relations between the city and the community? Uh, That's a great question. I mean, I think it, you know, we do have a really solid relationship with a lot of the businesses and owners there. I think it's important specifically because this was a bomb. This is different than Mm -hmm. just a development. I mean, there's a lot of emotion. There's a lot here to it. Um, It's still hard. I mean, very Honestly, it's still very hard for the businesses. They're open throughout this process. So we have to maintain communication and be able to pivot and do everything we can to help keep the businesses open and active and something that's really important. So that that communication, I think, is genuinely the reason we have been as successful as we have been. I don't want to get off track, but Mm -hmm. how did you react when you heard the news of the bombing? Oh, my gosh. I was listening to everybody before, and it just – it I turned to my colleague and said, I'm kind of reliving this, you know, mm. it's, it was emotional. I mean, of course I'm a native, Nashville native, I'm born and raised here. Um, and I heard, you know, heard about it. And um, my boss at the time lived on third and church. So literally right around the corner, he, I, first thing I did was text him like, oh my gosh, are you okay? And then pretty quickly, I mean, it very much like what was talked about before having to go through Christmas, you've got kids, you've got, you know, it's Christmas morning in 2020, which was already a hard enough year as it is with the global pandemic. Here we are having to go through the motions. And I mean, your heart is just somewhere else. And yeah. so um, it, it's emotional. It's been emotional this whole way through. All right. Fast forwarding to today, there's still construction going on. What construction is left to be done? So there's three blocks that we're rebuilding as part of this streetscape project. So from Broadway up to Union. Uh, the first block from church to union is complete, and we reopened it to vehicles last month 
actually about a month and a half ago. We actually had a block party. It was wonderful to have the first thing there is to celebrate on Second Avenue. That yeah. was pretty cool. Um, but we are right in the thick of it with construction on that southern block, the one that's closest to Broadway. Um, it's expected to finish towards the beginning of the year. And then the full project, that middle block where the source of the blast was, that's really the last place for the streetscape to rebuild. And that's going to be towards the end of next year. So everything's on schedule. Yeah. All right. We've got to be. So you mentioned that the city, you know, you mentioned obviously Lower Broadway's popularity mm -hmm. and how it draws so many tourists mm -hmm. there to the region. You can, but you kind of want to do something different with Second Avenue. So, you know, you want to make it a place, a special place for locals, particularly those who loved going back down there and who are anticipating being able to go back and enjoy that place. How can, how are you designing it to where Second Avenue is a place for both locals and tourists? Because sometimes wherever tourists go, locals try to avoid. Yeah. I believe me, I know that. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I mean, like I said, I'm a, Born and raised here, so I very much understand. Also, work downtown, so I see, I witness downtown. Um, you know, it is different. I mean, I went to Second Avenue in high school and college. This is, there's a lot of nostalgia there. There's a lot of great feelings there, and I think one of the things that we really want is to create a different feeling. Outdoor dining is something that's happening, really activating the streets. It's a very sustainable street. We're we're revamping uh, pedestrian trash and recycling and making that a better situation. We're also working with the businesses and just elevating the entire experience. That's kind of the goal for everything so that there is a nice inviting space for people to come during lunch breaks or happy hours with your girlfriends or date nights, that kind of thing. So, I mean, and and like we've heard, there's a lot of folks who live on and around Second Avenue. And so I think creating that space for the locals is very, um, very much at the core of what we're doing. And I'm selfishly hmm. glad to be leading that charge. <laughs> All right. What are you looking forward to you doing the most when it, it fully reopens? Well, I absolutely cannot wait to sit out there and have a glass of wine and enjoy the new trees and landscape and hang out with my friends and just really finally actually celebrate it. Hmm. Um, you know, it's going to be a great thing when, when we're all said and done. Um, I'm also excited about turning the corner and going to the other side because the back side of the buildings faces First Avenue. And, you know, from the beginning community engagement process, from the experts that we heard from, you know, rebuilding Second Avenue has been the first step. But taking a look at First Avenue, because we heard earlier, it's kind of a back alley. Mm -hmm. There was only one address on First Avenue, and that's Ron Lim's hostel. That's it. So there's an opportunity there as well to continue the vision and create more space for locals. So you mentioned outdoor dining. Will it be a place where like out performances will happen? If there's, you know, a big event happening in the city, will it be centered in that area? Hmm, that's interesting. One of the things that um, we've toyed around with a little bit, specifically uh, towards the end of construction, is having pop-up events. Um, you know, there's a lot of because of the outdoor dining, because of all of the restaurants and bars there, there's some interest in doing something like a pop of a pop up event where you can have, you know, performances outside and maybe a VIP area kind of thing. I think for when you have the really big city events, you know, Second Avenue is going to be something unique, uh, special. And, you know, I think that's something that will draw maybe a different kind of crowd. Now, I know a lot of these efforts are due to the bombing. Mm hmm. But there's other cities and areas, other parts of the city that could use a revitalization effort. Most coming to mind is Jefferson Street. Mm -hmm. Can this plan for Second Avenue be replicated in other areas of the city like Jefferson Street? I don't see why not. I mean, I think it starts with, um, you know, understanding the community, understanding what everybody wants, what would benefit, what you want to maintain and keep and what you don't want to lose and what could be better think it starts there. I mean, it's a, it's, it's hopefully a, an opportunity, an example of how we can grow for us. So what do you, what do you want folks to know and look forward to the most about Second Avenue in this most recent iteration? So one of the things that I, I think a big takeaway right now is while it's under construction, the businesses are open. Um, it, it is a little hard to get down the sidewalk, to be quite honest. I mean, you're, anybody who's lived through construction has seen that and, and felt that. Um, but the businesses are open. There's folks who are there who've been there for 42 years. You know, go see them. It's so important, especially for the locals. Go go have lunches there, meet, you know, friends down there, 
tell the owners, tell the staff that, hey, I'm a local of want to see the progress. I mean, every day it's a little different. And so it's exciting to watch it. Michelle, thank you so much for being with us. Michelle Scopel is the Urban Development Senior Project Manager for MDHA. Again, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And thanks to you for tuning in this hour. This is Nashville is a production of Nashville Public Radio. Today's episode was produced by Ambriel Crutchfield. Thank you for hooking us up and your great work. It was directed by Tasha A.F. Lemley. Our technical director and board operator is Liv Lombardi. The Masterminds behind our theme music are LaRange and Namir Blade. You can listen back at thisisnashville.org or wherever you get good podcasts. And the conversation doesn't end here. Tweet us at This Is Nashville. Find us on Instagram. Tell us what you want from our show by filling out our quick survey online. You can also leave us a message. It's a new number, so listen carefully. 615-751-2500. 615-751-2500. That's our new number, y'all. This is Nashville. I'm Khalil Ekelona. We'll see you tomorrow, everybody, and be good to each other.